Okay, welcome back. I hope you had some time to think about this particular question. Let's quickly take up the answer. Okay, so I have some space over here in my notes to start writing out the answer. Well, what do we know? Well, since the rank of A, which is equal to the dimension of the column space of A, and we know that the column space of A has to sit inside of R7 because we're looking at a seven by five matrix. We have that the dimension of the column space of A must be less than or equal to seven. Okay, but what else do we know? Well, by the rank theorem, we also know that the rank of my matrix A must be less than or equal to the rank of A plus the dimension of the null space of A, which is equal to five, right? So this is the number of columns. So this number here is equal to also equal to the rank. So the rank is less than or equal to seven and the rank is less than or equal to five. And so the rank has to be less than or both of those. So the rank of A has to be less than or equal to the minimum of five and seven, which is five. So the rank of your matrix has, has to be at most five. It can be at most five. And it might be smaller, but it can't be any larger than five. And what about the null space? Well, by the rank theorem again, we're gonna kind of do something similar. We know that the dimension of the null space of A is equal to five minus the rank of A. And this is gonna be less than or equal to five minus the minimum of five and seven. So this is equal to zero. So the null space, the smallest that it can be is zero in this particular case for this particular example. Okay. But there's actually something deeper going on here. Um, and let me just move up here, is that in general, if you have an M by N matrix, what we just did, we can actually just replicate what we did in this example to prove the following facts, that the rank is always going to be less than or equal to the minimum of the two numbers. And the dimension of the null space is always going to be equal to n minus the minimum of m and n. So we always have these bounds coming from the rank theorem by looking at your matrix A. Okay. So this second one is actually, of course, quite interesting. If the M is the smaller thing and the N is the bigger thing, that means that there is going to be something in your matrix uh, inside of your null space. Okay. And kind of one of the last things we're going to talk about here is how you can use the notion of rank when in connection with invertible matrices. So we're going to kind of restrict to the case now that A is a square matrix. And the first theorem that we have here is that if you have a, a square matrix, then it's invertible if and only if the rank of the matrix is n. So it's, another way to think about this is we're getting another measure of invertibility. So rank is another way of measuring if your matrix is, has an inverse, just like the determinant. And, that's, and let's talk, uh, excuse me, let's try that again. Uh, let's walk our way to the proof. Well, the rank of A is equal to n, that implies that, clean that up, that implies that the dimension of the null space of A has to be equal to zero. This is coming from the rank theorem because the rank of A plus the dimension has to be n. So that means the dimension of the null space is zero. But when the dimension of the null space is zero, that means that the null space of your matrix only contains the zero vector. But that means that Ax equals zero has only the trivial solution. And another way of saying that is saying that A is invertible. So what we're getting is 
a new way to classify invertible matrices. And in fact, now we can go over to the next sheet over here, and we can add a whole bunch of new conditions to the invertible matrix theorem. So here we have that A is an N by N matrix, then the following are equivalent. Okay, and let me write it. So let's say that A is an invertible matrix. Well, what we also get is that the columns of A, columns of A form a basis for Rn. We also get that the column space of A is equal to Rn. The fourth thing that we have, which is the dimension of the column space of A is equal to N. And in fact, you can proving three implies four is actually quite easy, right? If three is true, then both, both sides have to have the same dimension. Since Rn has dimension N, the column space has to have dimension N. The next statement kind of falls directly from four. So the rank of A has to be N, right? That is clear because they're actually the same number. The other condition that we have using the rank theorem is that the dimension of the null space is zero. And another way of saying this is that when the dimension is, is zero, then that means the null space is the trivial subspace. So what we're getting here is a bunch of new ways of describing whether a matrix is invertible by looking at some of these subspaces that you get from the matrix. Here's the column space. Uh, we've got rank, which has the row space, and then we have the null space. So describing those properties, uh, describing invertibility in terms of properties of those subspaces. So there are a bunch of new ideas in today's lecture. One of them was the row space of a matrix. We also learned about the rank of a matrix. And more importantly, one of the big things that we learned was the rank theorem. So that's it uh, for uh, chapter four, actually. Starting in the next lecture, in lecture 28, we'll be talk moving to chapter five when we talk about eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So I'll see you then.